Well, hello, Foot Clan. Today, we are having an awesome time talking through the Falcons, talking through the Panthers, talking through the Bucks, talking through one of the best divisions in fantasy football, but more important than that, you know it, you came here for it. It's carry on Johnson time. Hey, Foot Clan, we got a great show prepared for you today. Jason can barely contain himself. He wants to talk carry on, but before we get this thing started, couple quick reminders. Number one, you got to check out the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. We just made a huge update to the app version. UDK users can now draft players, star and mark players, and choose whether or not to display drafted players in the app. This is a huge upgrade. We listen to your request. We put it in there, and you can learn all about the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. We also want to thank Navy Federal for sponsoring today's show. Navy Federal is proud to serve over 8 million members, including active duty military, the DOD veterans, and their families. You'll receive a lifetime of membership benefits with Navy Federal, and you can easily access accounts, transfer money, pay bills, deposit checks, all with the Navy Federal mobile app. Visit NavyFederal.org slash footballers for more information or call 1-888-842-6328 or download the Navy Federal Credit Union app. Message and data rates may apply. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in my club! Woo! He didn't even time it up right. I don't no. need to time anything right today. <laughs> I'm just well, here to bask in the glory. Welcome into the show. I pointed at Jason. I said, of all the days that you get to open the show, do the yell, why not today, the day you're wearing a, a royal robe, a crown upon your head? Look, I, I love that, uh, I believe it was this morning, you mocked our good friend. Good, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sir Jason. <laughs> our uh, our good friend of, of the show and uh, host of our DFS show, Jake Seeley. Oh, for, you noticed that, did for you? For taking a preseason <laughs> victory lap, which is pretty much the dumbest thing you can do. But I am... What are you talking about? Am, it's the time for it, man. Yes. This is the best. Well, it is the only time you can do a preseason victory lap. You are right there. It's the preseason. <laughs> but I'm on it. And I'm lapping Jake Seeley right now. I'm on I'm on lap 10. And that's on the basis of you having a crown on your head, mm -hmm. a what robe are you behind about? you. This I, whole thing? <laughs> when I came in this morning, I asked Brooks for one thing. I said, do you have a paper bag? I think Jason may need to breathe into a paper bag to contain himself we, on today's show. Look, YouTube, you are just lucky that Jason is the back. He is not on the sides. He is positioned very specifically oh. in the back because... I'm I, not sure he's wearing pants. That's exactly... I can't confirm or deny... If always oh, got it, and it says King of the Castle on the back of the rope. So if you are, if you're joining us for the first time, have we maybe even said what happened? Maybe you don't know that Jason is the greatest Carry On Johnson truther in the land. And Proud what's of it. incredible is last week we said, I said there were rumors right. that Theo Riddick could actually get cut. It was a bit of a surprise, I think, to you guys, and he was cut. It, it definitely was not a surprise. Uh, a shock to me because I had read those reports a while ago. About a month ago, I tweeted like, "Hey, let's let's get this thing to happen." Some of the beat reporters were talking about how much money they could save by cutting them. They still like Zach Zinner. They brought C.J. Anderson, so they had the room to spare. But I, I mean, this is a huge deal because Carry On Johnson is not going to be one of those 265 carry backs. That's not what they brought him in for. That's not the system that they want him to be in. But he <clears throat> can be one of those Alvin Kamara type backs that can get 215, 220 carries and add in 80 targets. Yeah, and, you a know, lot. If you are utilized in that way, which obviously the Lions, I mean, look over the last five years, I believe uh, Theo Riddick is the leader, if not he's like number two in total targets at a running back position. And now that is the role that Carryon Johnson is going to Phil, that's not a Zach Zinner specialty. It's not a C.J. Anderson specialty. So now you have a guy who is your first and second down back, who is definitely the receiving back to a team and a quarterback that knows how to utilize that space, and he is great. But I say all that, and I'm a little upset. I'm a little upset at this news because I was getting carry on Johnson 
everywhere. His fourth round ADP was stupid as it was every third round or in the fourth round I would grab carry on Johnson and now oh yeah good luck with that now I don't now I'm, I just don't get him in all my leagues now it's like people are putting him really high in their rankings as they should now he's gonna skyrocket so I want to get everybody's take on this today is the final divisional show we have the NFC South on the show today you can follow the podcast the fantasy footballers on Twitter at the FF ballers and um Look, it's go time now. I mean, news is breaking by the minute. I guarantee. I mean, we're we're recording the show Monday for the Tuesday episode, and we'll probably be behind on some of the news that comes out today. But there's so much to cover. I want to know what Mike. I want to know what your expectations are for Carry On. I've done a lot of thinking about this. My knee jerk reaction, Jason. Mm -hmm. The second this news happened, I jumped in, and I I my impulse was to make Carry On Johnson my running back eleven. Uh, that's where that's where I went in, and I, I'm just going to appropriate Theo Riddick. And the more I thought about this thing, where I ended up was basically here. And you can you can counterpoint me, you can receive this if it's possible with the crown upon your head. But I think a couple things. I have him at 16, and I think it's actually borderline impossible for him to be a top 10 back this year. That's the honest truth. After what I here's how I feel about the situation is that. Um, Obviously, we know what you said is 100% right. He will be the pass catching back. We know that being the pass catching back does not guarantee fantasy success for you. Otherwise, Jalen Richard and Austin Eckler and uh, TJ Yeldon, these are all guys with over 60 receptions last year that, that aren't upper echelon guys. It's going to come down to how much work he gets in the running game and scoring opportunities. Here's the problem that I have with projecting carry on Johnson too high and why I think he will be an ADP trap is that over the last couple of years, there uh, last year there were three running backs in the top ten that were on teams that were worse than 500. The year before, there were only two. And so, first of all, you're up against it if you're on a team that is not going to be a winning football team at the running back position. You already know one of those this it's year Saquon. won't be Saquon. Yeah. And then you're talking, is it Mixon? Is it Lev Bell? Who are the other guys? Is, is Carrion going to beat those guys? Last year, the Lions were 24th in yards per game, 25th in points per game, and this is not a team that I think I project to be a winning football team. They play in a division with the Vikings twice and the Bears defense two different times. And so, you know, we talk about David Johnson as that kind of use case of, okay, you're on a bad team and you, you did really well, right? Well, for David Johnson to battle his way to number 10 last year, he had 258 carries and 50 receptions. I don't believe, and this is on the basis of evidence, that they'll give carry on the work that you want. Because Matt Patricia has already set forth a precedent and displayed evidence of him looking through a different lens than we are. Carry on is hyper talented, but CJ Anderson and Zach Zinner, they both graded out the same as Carry On in the running game last year. And there's just this there's also the risk factor of injury that Carry On struggled with last year. So I think it's actually really, really going to be impossible for him to be a top ten guy. I settled at 16. Well, if that's the case, then we have to water bet a top 12. Because I, I'm he, totally it, comfortable water betting you know, a top then that's, 12. That's yeah. a done deal. Yeah, that's, that's fine. And that's, water bet. That's nothing to do with Carrion Johnson not being one of the most talented guys. If you told me Carrion Johnson was on the Los Angeles Chargers, I think he now, would have a different opportunity. But I only have him for four rushing touchdowns on the year. That's okay. the honest truth. Sure, that's that's fine you can you can uh have him down for that when you say that we've seen the evidence already that he's not going to get the workload he needs you're just wrong because last year once the first that's two not weeks, what i said i said i've seen the evidence of matt patricia looking through a different lens and giving an an extra work to a guy that was the least efficient running back in football last season sure. because he wanted to give him the work the the first two weeks last year, Carrion Johnson wasn't a starter, wasn't really involved much. It was all the Garrett Blunt. He started taking over week three, played through week 10, then was injured and out from 11 on. From week three through 10, he was already, that was with last year's terrible Lions, injured Matthew Stafford, uh, trading away Golden Tate, you know, all the hullabaloo still with Matt Patricia. He was on a 16 game pace of 210 carries and 48 receptions, not targets, receptions. With Theo Riddick there, 1,162 yards on the ground, 340, so almost 1,500 combined yards. And here's the thing. We all know, and if you don't know, 
now you now know, you know that the the fantasy points per reception are so they're they're nearly triple depending on your league format than a rushing attempt so if you're talking about a guy who can be a 60 70 reception back that's going to be hard to not be in the top 15 or even the top 10 so I I think he's firmly in the top 12 obviously you don't we've made a water bet and the best part about fantasy football is we're going to get to figure it out but I love hearing your shade and I hope shade comes because let's keep his ADP low. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting. Mike, where do you weigh in on Carrion's projection? How did you adjust him? Where is he at in your rankings? So I'm far more on the side with Jason. He moved up to number 12 for me, so I do have him in that range. And and just to speak a little bit more to the, the shift, yes, at the beginning, don't, don't buy into the beginning of the season what happened, where it was really frustrating that Matt Patricia was putting LeGarrette Blunt out there. Once Carry On put a full stranglehold on the starting job, I mean, LeGarrette Blunt was getting three carries, five, six, seven, and then his end of season numbers looked good because once Carry On Johnson left the season with an injury, then they went back to LeGarrette Blunt being the primary ball carrier. And we do have very, very small sample. It's only two games, but if you look at the split where the, where Theoretic was out, but Carry On Johnson was in. He went up literally two full targets a game, up to five and a half. I mean, he, which is, by the way, like that's 88 targets. So that puts a, it puts very realistic for Kerryon Johnson to hit that 60-plus reception area. If he's a 200-carry guy, a 60-plus reception guy, then Kerryon Johnson is going to be a stud. Do you believe that Matt Patricia, Zach, both Zach Zinner and – C.J. Anderson are leaps and bounds ahead of what LeGarrette Blunt was from an efficiency standpoint. They brought in C.J. Anderson for a purpose. I'm concerned that C.J. will get the goal line work. Zach Zinner will get the goal line work. And you won't see enough in the running game to, to get in that top 10. But 70 receptions. If you, if you told me he's going to be over 70, it changes the equation a little bit. Yeah, maybe. Maybe they give some goal line work to C.J. Anderson. Or maybe C.J. Anderson was good last year because – everybody's good at the running back position for the Rams, and they're going to find out very quickly that there is a reason that C.J. Anderson was cut from, the was cut from multiple teams. Oh, and that's right. He, he signed – who did he sign with? The was, Niners? No, Oakland. He signed with he someone just, for a week and then got cut again he, after the Panthers. He was struggling to get a job. Carrion Johnson, I, I believe Carrion will, will, will receive the vast majority of the work, including goal line work. All right, we've got so much more news to cover. <laughs> News and notes from around the league, presented by Sleeper. All right, AJ Green. Ugh. Hashtag BTS. Yeah. yeah. This one feels bad. Lower than below the belt. It feels below oh, the shin. Below it the is shin. below the nice. shin. Six to eight weeks, he's going to be sidelined. Torn ligaments in his left ankle. That is a different foot. All of his struggles last year <laughs> yeah. was the right, right foot, right toe. This is now the left. Yeah, it is par for the course now for A.J. Green. I mean, he, through the beginning of his career, always healthy and reliable, now always injured. Can I, can I bring out a comp here and see if you guys are as afraid as I am? I'm going to throw a name out there and see if You this can do whatever you want, King. Sweet. Doug Baldwin. Right, as Does, in as in last year, you started to see him dealing with injuries, and then in camp he got injured again, and we're like, well, his value was there because now he was dropping. My biggest takeaway, if you remember our, our Things to Remember episode, was in the preseason, in the draft season, I'm not buying the injury dip. I was in on Doug Baldwin last year. I was like, well, he's so good. He's on a great offense. He's been a top wide receiver for multiple years. When you had Pete Carroll saying everything was perfectly fine. And then his ADP dropped. He looked juicy there. And obviously, anybody who drafted Doug Baldwin was very disappointed. So, is there a comp there or not? I, I Man, I think there might be a bit of a comp there because I was going to say, where, where are we willing to draft A.J. Green now knowing – he misses one to three games, and then at, even when he comes back, is he at full strength? Now I think I projected him at 77% of the season. Okay. Ooh, so that's got to body him. That's just where I want him to be positioned in rankings for people prescriptively where you draft him. 
it's not good because when you come back from an injury like that, you don't know how limited the player is going to be. Exactly. Even if he's back in two to three games, is he not really back for four to five? Does he re-injure himself? Here's the reality. You're over 30 years old. You don't generally trend in a positive injury direction. It takes you longer to get back. Your chance of re-injury happens more and more. I love A.J. Green, the player, when he's healthy. So, I, look, you, you, it's risk aversion. Do you want to take the chance on him? You'll probably get a deal on him. Nobody wants to touch him right now. I mean, if you're... Seventh if, round? If Sixth round? Yeah, I mean, so like the Tyler Lockett's, Kenny Galladay's, that, that area, are you taking them or A.J. Green? I'm taking them. I'm taking them. I am as well. All right, the Giants, they... Uh, by the way, A.J. Green is down to our consensus wide receiver 28 at now, the moment. I, I will say this as well. I, I think this is – I mean, obviously this is bad news for the Bengals as an organization from a winning standpoint. I think this is bad for the fantasy implications for the other players as well. Not a catastrophe. Uh, a lot's been made about Tyler Boyd not being as good with A.J. Green off the field. Part of that was his two, two of his worst games were with O'Driscoll, <laughs> the <Yeah>. O'Driscoll boys. <laughs> But it does hurt. Oh, that's a throwback. It hurts Joe Mixon that Jeff, a Jeff little. Jeff Driscoll? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I remember that. It hurts. Uh, I mean, it, this is this is something I think that takes away a little bit from Mixon, a little bit from Boyd. Definitely it, it helps a lot John from Ross. Dalton. <laughs> yes. yes. It yeah. does. I mean, if you if you want to talk about some opportunity in the first couple of weeks, I mean, you can't throw it to Boyd on every play. It helps Tyler Eifert maybe from a target perspective. I don't know. It It's just unfortunate for fantasy owners. I mean, I, I've been wanting to – Steal a healthy A.J. Green in the fourth round. It's not going to happen now. Giants wide receiver Golden Tate, four-game suspension for violating the PED policy. He is appealing. He is going to lose. I, I will be shocked if he loses. He he's will going, be shocked. I will he, be shocked if he loses. If he does not get it reduced to two games or even just removed, I, I will count really? me surprised. Do you guys know the story? So Of course yes. I know the story. Yeah. A man took, he took some uh, – Medications for, for fertility for fertility without checking the label right. before you get in the NFL. You the, always get popped for that. Sure, and you get popped, and he acknowledged, like, of course, he knew a suspension had to come. And but yes, he talked to them ahead of time, just like Benjamin Watson did when he took the same exact fertility treatments over the off season. He went ahead and told the league before he got popped. His suspension was upheld. But there was a big difference because Benjamin Watson was was doing a full treatment. He was retired, and and that's where the performance enhancing comes in. Whereas Golden Tate found out stopped, alerted them, had no performance enhancing, and then that was before being tested. So I, I would, I think it should be removed down to two, but we'll You see. are the king. If you could institute that yourself, if I would I buy into the, your narrative. If I could make the ruling, I don't believe he had any performance enhancing uh, from performance enhancement from this, and he alerted them before ever failing, He's so stupid. I would say remove it. Yeah, it was a He's dumb stupid. decision. Yeah, yeah they've... The NFL has pretty, been pretty hard-nosed on you better know what you're putting in your body. It sure. doesn't matter. High level of uh, accountability there. Derrick Henry in a walking boot. Got injured in Friday's practice. Titans say they're not worried about the lower leg injury. That's fine. I mean, they, they should yeah. be worried about not having Derrick Henry this year. If the entire offense is supposed to be on his back and he goes down and you look at that running back room and you wonder, it does. I mean, what, what, what are you going to get? You're going to get Deion Lewis. Yes, I mean, you are. It, it does bring to light the fact that Deion Lewis is a quality handcuff. And and he's more than that, obviously, in the sense that he because he's a pass catcher, he could be have some flex appeal yes. on a weekly basis. But I had pretty much been leaving Deion Lewis for dead in, in my drafts, in, th in my thought process. So that that's where it brings. It's too early to know. We don't even know what the foot injury is. No, but it does bring Deion Lewis to mind. You're right. Damian Williams left Sunday's practice, hamstring tweak, also mispracticed uh, on Monday. So right now, hamstring injury for Damian Williams. We don't know how long that will be, but not great news. No. I mean, no, I, I, we hate hamstring injuries in training camp because they can linger. Uh, I'm, so I would we'll get mine see. removed. If I was going to the NFL <laughs> – you know how you don't pull a hamstring? Don't mm -hmm. have one. Did get rid of that mm. ACL. I'm I'm removing everything, my ankle. Everything below the shin. Yeah. So two I mean, roller blades. Uh, obviously, these can linger. They can come back. Uh, but he should be fine timeline wise. But there is a concern here of like, look, if Lev Bell uh, misses camp for a hamstring issue, when he comes back, he's the guy. There's no chance someone plays into a timeshare here. There is a little bit of a worry. Not not I. I you know, I still got him. I didn't adjust him yet. But it's one of those, like, if you look at those top backs in the draft, 
that's one of the worries with Damian Williams. He the investment in him is not. You have that to get the out. Al- yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let's move on. Let's talk about Sony Michelle. Activated from the PUP, practiced, looked great in practice from beat writers that were on scene. Right now, Michelle's being drafted behind Philip Lindsay, behind Mark Ingram. I, I, you Sony know, Michelle is a value as of today. He is, and this is coming from a guy who bodied him on our first live show. He was like my bust guy because he was up at the top of the third, almost a second round pick, and he had way too much risk. But now, I mean, if he uh, granted it's still early, the way. so he's gonna he's so he's he's dropped so much since then. It's so funny how the same player who can have the same outlook. I haven't changed my opinion on what I expect from him, but now when you're three rounds later, you're actually a value. All right, a little bit of hype. Let's talk about it. Frank Reich impressed with one of Mike's favorite rookies, yeah. Paris Paris Campbell hype train. Um, Frank Reich came out like a fantasy football fan with this quote um, saying, look, th- he was making legit NFL, I'm going to be a stud receiver plays. I like this Frank Reich voice. Yeah. <laughs> what he did in the red zone weren't hybrid gadget slot receiver plays. They were legit. So, Paris Campbell, uh, his involvement in the screen game, one of the best screen game players uh, in college, one of the best screen game players probably heading into this year, changes my opinion a little bit about Naeem Hines' volume, changes my opinion on, uh, look, Devin Funches, he, he was hurt, came back in during practice, but made people think about Paris Campbell. The Twitter victory laps are hilarious. I mean, because Devin Funches left the field, and I saw multiple people say, like, this is Paris Campbell's se- season. It's over. Like, it, he's taken over. And then, like, they roll Devin Funches back out, puts his helmet back on, he plays. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> we're looking. You got to be quick with those victory laps. <laughs> Look, you gotta, that's why it's as, the best. As soon as you hear the news, just start running. Well, as soon as the lap is done. Yeah, you did it. You, you completed it. You mean you took your victory lap. Yeah. Paris, Campbell hel- Paris, Feels good. <laughs> Paris Campbell helps Andrew Luck. Oh, yeah. But Paris does, Campbell he, is does great. he help fantasy owners? I'm still weary. <laughs> I'm still weary of drafting a, a rookie who's not the number one option, might be the number two option. By the end of the season, I think Paris Campbell makes some noise, but we've talked about this before. Most of the time, when look at last year, right? There was some noise making rookie wide receivers. DJ Moore had a great stretch, Dante Pettis had a great stretch. But they were second half of the season. They didn't. They don't get off to a strong start usually. All right, uh, Kalen Blanche quote has a real chance to win the starting job, according to ESPN's Cameron Wolf. Uh, it's going to be a. I think it'll be a big time split there. I have them at same carries, one seventy five each. Yeah. Uh, Miles Boykin, Marquise Brown. Any interest? Ravens camp talking up Miles Boykin, most impressive receiver. Well, you are going to be when uh, there's no one else and, except for Willie Sneed and Marquise Brown. They're First round rookie isn't even on the field. Sometimes those reports are deceptive because there just aren't a lot of other players out there. Yeah, Miles Boykin though, any thoughts, interest? Not really. The guy who's been targeted has been the receiver we like the best. I mean, yeah, it's not that. I, if I need to get a Baltimore receiver, it's Mark Andrews at tight end. Maurice Harris, wide receiver from New England, one of the guys I really liked on film in Washington last season. They had a lot of injuries at the wide receiver position. He stepped in. He played um, played up to that, that opportunity he had, got signed by New England, uh, and now their beat reporter Andrew Callahan's reporting he's been the best receiver in camp by a decent margin. I also read that. Same story. Julian Edelman, their best receiver, isn't playing. Yeah, but he is playing ahead of. Um, uh, Nikhil Harry? Nikhil Harry's yeah. playing in Harry's th- playing three wide receivers. Twos, but that's, Harry will eventually be one of the starters. I've. I'm right now it's Harris interested. and Dorsett in the yeah. starting lineup. And by the way, we do we do need to bring up that 49ers running back, Jarek McKinnon, was placed on the active PUP list, possibly making this uh, the, the mess of the San Francisco 49er backfield a little bit easier to decode because it'll be – right now it's Tevin Coleman. With a flare-up to his ACL. Yeah, with uh, to his knee, yeah. yeah. Right now it's Tevin Coleman, I think is by far the, the highest probability odds of being – uh, being the guy with fantasy value, but then it's Matt Barina and and don't forget Colonel Mustard there. My name as, is Jeff. <laughs> as the RB three. But look, if someone there, somebody there will have value. Hundred percent. I think two two can have value there. Two. You two, think two both players, Coleman and Barita can be in a out? Shanahan offense? If if they're a top half offense, they can both have value. Matt Barita was dominant last year. 
not kind of good. Bet, uh, one of the best pure runners in the game from a metric standpoint. They're going to use him. And then Tevin Coleman has the history with Kyle Shanahan. Right. And going to have a, a, a tremendous amount of pass-catching opportunities. I think that they're just going to help that offense. And, look, if, value-wise, I mean, you got to pay for Tevin Coleman. Matt Breed is free. So sure. depending on what you want to do, if you're not certain that Coleman's your guy, like you don't like him, then take Burrito out of value. If you're certain about Coleman, take him high. I'm fine taking either, but if I had to put a shot, it would be on Burrito because of the price and the, and the fact that, look, we've seen Tevin Coleman utilized by Shanahan before, and it wasn't as a starter. He was a great, you know, come in, change of pace type of back, and so who's yes. to say – if there's someone, you know, there's always. I mean, the Falcon system of Freeman and Coleman are utilized as comps for. Yeah, it's for everyone. For I everyone, know, yes. any team. But if there's one person who's, who I could peg for a Tevin Coleman row role in a Kyle Shanahan system, it would be Tevin Coleman. It would yeah, be he him. fits the role better. Right. Now the thing is, is last year Coleman had an opportunity. Yeah. For the year to be more than what he was, and he didn't do it. He didn't really do it. Big he, play guy, but didn't really between the tackles wasn't um, consistent. That's why I think Brito will have a role. We'll see. That's today's news and notes. There'll be more and more and more and more over the next month. And a reminder, we're going five days a week from August through December. So we'll have time to talk about it all. Um, and a reminder, Sleeper doesn't just break the latest news. They sponsor our news segment and they are the best fantasy platform. Yep. I also want to thank today's sponsor, Smile Direct Club. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to get the chiclets right, and Smile Direct Club is helping you do that easier and cheaper than ever. They're straightening your teeth for 60% less than braces with clear aligners sent directly to you. You're just sitting at your home, and you're straightening your teeth. That's all I do at home. How I amazing sit, I just is sit there. that? You can go online. You can book a free 3D image at one of their shops, or you can order an at-home impression kit. They'll, they'll email a preview of your new smile. Get a look at how, how awesome. Your teeth are going to look. You can visit SmileDirectClub.com for real before and after photos. Look, you can get this free 3D image of your smile at one of their smile shops or get a $25 rebate on an at-home impression kit. Then, exclusive for our listeners, get $100 off your clear aligners at SmileDirectClub.com slash podcast and use the offer code FANTASY. Again, $100 off SmileDirectClub.com slash podcast. The offer code is FANTASY. One more time. SmileDirectClub.com slash podcast. The offer is, or offer code is fantasy. And Foot Clan, don't forget about Harry's. Join the 10 million people who have tried Harry's because they are great, high quality, affordable razor blades. It's exactly what you're looking for. And all of their razors and, and their, their uh, supplies are great for traveling. So if you're traveling this summer, you don't have to sacrifice quality for price. They deliver high quality travel friendly shave supplies at a great price, just $2 per blade. They actually bought a really good blade factory in Germany themselves so they could make great blades at a low price. It's a really, really good company. Uh, I've used them. My wife loves the blades as well. Long time she, sponsor. She uses them. I've They've been, using been them for with years. us forever. Look, this summer, refresh your wallet and your face with a Harry's trial set. It comes with a weighted ergonomic handle for easy grip five blade razor with lubricating strip and trimmer blade for close shave rich lathering shave gel that will keep you smelling great a travel blade cover to keep your razor dry and easy on the go listeners of our show they can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash footballers make sure you go to harrys.com slash footballers to redeem your offer let's get divisional all right, our final divisional matchup show, the NFC South. I've conceded due to all of the news and hype, and Jason, you've taken off the robe. You're ready to talk about a different division. I'm this just is, a man now. This is encouraging. <laughs> I'm just a man. Um, I've conceded this show's going to be a little longer. I don't care. That's fine. Um, I'm going to breathe, breathe into the paper bag. I'll be okay. It'll be a longer show. We're going to talk about the Saints, the Panthers, the Falcons, and the Buccaneers. And let's start with the Saints. 13-3 and three last year. So close to a Super Bowl berth. Oof, an, careful. An, that hurts. Careful. An absolutely great team. Uh, we saw the resurgence of this team last year in a big way. Their defense um, led the division in points against by a wide margin, and they were the, the second best rushing defense in terms of yards per game given up. 
and they were <laughs> incredible. Drew Brees led offense, sixth in yards per game rushing, as as a Sean Payton offense always is, and then twelfth in yards per game passing. They want to run the football. Mark Ingram is gone. See you later. Key subtraction, and they lost their center, Max Unger, a surprise retirement. Yeah. That's a fundamental piece of an offense. We saw a collapse in Seattle of the offensive line when, uh, well, this very same man <laughs> left. Max Unger ruining lines. So, look, it's just kind of a such a cerebral role. You You have the physical side of being a center. And then you have the understanding of what the line assignments need to be and being able to be on the same page with your quarterback. Um, so they drafted a center in the second round. How do you see this running game breaking down? Let's start there. Alvin Kamara, they add Latavius Murray. There's rumors of Theo Riddick visiting. Riddick's also visiting the Broncos. So Kamara, Murray, how do you see this offense I think we like Latavius Murray as a value because you're not buying him at the price you would have paid for Mark Ingram, but he's stepping into a role very similar. Yeah, and, and he is a, a similar back. I don't think the gap between Mark Ingram and Latavius Murray is as large as the ADP gap is. That being said, what you know what happens just naturally, human behavior, right? I mean, Alvin Kamara came into Mark Ingram's team. That was Mark Ingram was the incumbent and he was there. Now this is Alvin Kamara's team and Latavius Murray's coming in. So I don't expect Latavius Murray to get the exact same workload that that Mark Ingram received. I think he's going to have a slightly lighter version, which means more going to Kamara. And we saw the first four weeks last year when Mark Ingram was injured. Three of those first four weeks, Alvin Kamara wasn't a running back one. He was the, the yeah. running back one. That is amazing. So, I mean, that's why Kamara has really moved into that tier one group that, you know, those top four running backs that everybody wants a piece of one of those guys. Um, I, I'm not worried. Now, if, if Theo Riddick were to sign, does that, does that do you think, take away because of the fact that he is pretty much exclusively a pass-catching specialist, does that take no, away some of the value from where Kamara excels? No, because Theo Riddick is really bad at it. He's what? not. He's not good. He can, he's not. He's he can catch the ball, and he's one of the worst at actually if, doing anything with it once he has the ball. Sure, it but if you need your three offense. yards, he's one of the best. Yes, if you need three yards, yeah, he's your guy. <laughs> so no, I don't. I don't. One, I don't think he'll sign there. But if he does, I don't think he hurts Camaro too much. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, and I, you know, um, Evan Silva, he talked about a time he got to speak with Sean Payton. And Sean Payton said, basically, Kamara's soft. That's what, what? He, he said that. And when, uh, when was this quote from, though? This was last year. This was recent. Recent? Just in, in the context of the fact that he's not going to hold up under a huge workload. You need to have a complimentary back like Octavius Murray or Mark Ingram. And, um, you know, Kamara has had a concussion thing before. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a smaller guy. Um, he's going to be great. I love him. He's in our top echelon of backs, but anybody expecting him to suddenly become a 250 carry guy is just wrong. This is not going to happen. I, I agree with that completely. I mean, Sean Payton has always used multiple backs, and it's never, ever felt like one of the classic RBBCs because the the Saints running backs, if you just look historically, look at the last 10 years, or at least the Drew Brees, Sean Payton era, pretty much the Saints running backs as a team are number one or number two in right. fantasy production every single year. They know how to get their backs the ball in space. They know how to utilize them. When they get down near the goal line, they will use Kamara. Kamara is such an efficient goal line back. I have no worries about Kamara, and I would take Latavius Murray where his ADP is as well because not only do you have a, a, a guy who could start in the flex on s pretty much most weeks, I would say, but if Kamara goes down and they're forced to – you know, they'll still split the workload up. It's not like Latavius Murray would just go complete lion share, but he will be the the presumed starter, and that's just a valuable role. It is, and let's talk about Jared Cook because there are those of you out there that want to take Jared Cook's, you know, you look at what he did last year, very effective. There's some hype around camp. but We also have the cautionary tale of Kobe Fleener in New sure. Orleans, the cautionary tale of, Look, how much of Jared Cook's successful season last year was the product of just pure, unadulterated target opportunity because everybody was hurt and injured and Derek Carr likes to throw the ball short. And Jared Cook was, you know, he's an athletic player, 
but consistency hasn't been his mo. And I wonder, you know, I've I've projected pretty high, but he's going in, in the seventh round because I think some people believe the same thing that he could be kind of one of those sneaky tight ends with Breeze and. You know, it's Michael Thomas and everybody else right now in the passing right. game. So that's why Jared Cook is interesting. And to answer your question, was his fantasy value and output last year completely related to the fact that Oakland had no one else to throw the ball to? The answer is 100% yes. yes. However, not all tight ends, if they're put in that position, can actually have the success that production, Jared, the, the production and success that Jared Cook had last year. Meanwhile, the Saints tight ends, I mean, they're they're still getting big plays. Last year, they had 14 receptions of 20 or more yards. That was eighth in the league. That's only five fewer splash plays than Philadelphia and Zach Ertz and six fewer than Kansas City and Travis Kelsey. Like, and that's with the conglomeration of Dan Arnold, the postman, who on, the, on Monday through Friday is delivering your mail and then played for the Saints on Sundays. <laughs> then you had Josh Hill... And Ben Watson, these were the guys, and they were still able to put up decent production. And if one guy can take a leap, a, Jared Cook is—he's interesting to me. I think we we at least learned a little bit from what happened with Kobe Fleener because his hype train got out of control. I feel like Kobe Fleener was like a. Do you know anybody that pick. was like super into him? Mm. I do. I don't know. And I <laughs> I do know, and I feel that is directly correlated with the reason that Jason is so hesitant to get on board I with don't, Jared. That, that, that's possible. The, it, it Jared Cook outside of his top ten. Uh, Mike at six. I'm at seven. I've got him at eleven. So I've got him as a back end tight end one. But if he's going in the seventh round, my tight end eleven is not going to pay off as as a seventh round value. Sure, not and, at all. And the the fact that he's clearly, I mean, he is not going to be the guy. And the question is, best case scenario, he's third in targets behind Kamara and behind Michael Thomas. Realistically, when you talk about Ted Ginn and Traquan Smith, now you're talking about is he is he fifth? Is he sixth in targets? He'll have some big games, but he's not going to have the target volume I want he to could, be reliable he to could, me. He, I, I would bet he's third in targets. You would I, bet from that a, he's third from a in target tar standpoint, yes, because distribution from non Michael Thomas wide receivers, I think, will be spread around. Whereas, sure, Ginn Gin and so, Traquan could very well eat into and, each other. That could happen. And here, here's here's another point: Oakland, eighteen points a game, fifth worst. New Orleans, thirty one points a game, third highest scoring team. So, even if he doesn't get what he gets in Oakland, he he's going to score more. There's just no doubt about it. He has to. Well, and, and it is interting. They Jared Cook had the opportunity, at least uh, rumor-wise, to go to New England and Can't replace be Gronk, and he chose to come to right. New Orleans. So, you Very know, interesting. Must have been something there. Unless uh, it was just money. Got a $6 million signing bonus. That people, helps. Uh, Humphreys turned down more money. Humphreys could have made more money in New England. Nobody wanted to go, go, I go to the Patriots. Why? Why? Too many, like, Super Bowls? I guess. <laughs> I don't get it. Uh, outside of Michael Thomas, we don't need to talk about him. He's locked and loaded, assuming he's signed. Yes, and I just one nugget that I came across with Michael Thomas to his greatness of of last year. So before last year, the highest catch percentage for a wide receiver with a hundred or more targets it was Wes Welker in two thousand seven. He caught seventy seven percent of his passes, which is a player of that volume is insane. Last year, Michael Thomas caught 125 passes on 147 targets, which is an 85% catch rate. Like we looked at his rookie year and went, "Oh, that's an that's an outlier because it was like 75%. He can't possibly do that." Uh, yeah, he can. Michael Thomas is really good, and and that's because Drew Brees. So we'll it's talk also about now. really good. Drew Brees throws the ball closer to the line of scrimmage than almost any quarterback in football. Josh Allen's at the polar opposite. Breeze's average depth of target is minuscule, and he's getting older. So it's not really going to change. He's hyper-accurate yes. <laughs> within that range. Some would say the most accurate Ever. quarterback of all time. Some. Some. Just what? statistically speaking. Yes. Uh, Drew Breeze, is he an every, every week fantasy starter? No. Because of that sweet completion percentage bonus that no. your league obviously has? No, I, I I, don't view him as an every week uh, starter. Certainly not someone that you have to start on a weekly basis. If you look at Drew Brees, is he going to finish as a top 12 option? Sure. Will he have great weeks? Absolutely. He plays in a division when he's playing the, the Falcons and the Panthers where 
you're going to have and, – and, and, and the, the Bucks. Bucks. Where you're going to have these big games, but their defense is good. They get off to a pretty tough stretch playing four – uh, starting uh, all four teams that they start the season made the playoffs last season and in those games you might see a little bit more defense a little bit more running I mean two years ago Drew Brees really let people down for fantasy so I mean he's not a bad option but he's not in every week he's he's a guy that I'm fine to drop to waivers to pick up off of waivers here here's a secret it, it, there's 12 quarterbacks that play on a weekly basis in your league if you're in a 12-man league there are 12 tight ends I am not shooting for 7 through 12 in either of those positions right. at any time. I don't want to draft the guy hoping that I get somebody in the bottom half of my league's quarterbacks or bottom half of my league's tight ends. Breeze, to me, doesn't offer me the opportunity to, at that value, slide into the top six. That's why he's off my board. There you go. All right, Traquan Smith or Ted Ginn, who are you taking your shot at? Right now, if you look at ADPs, um, Traquan's a 12th rounder. Ginn's undrafted. Uh, if I have to take a shot on one of them, I guess it's going to be Traquan. But what if you combine them? What if it's uh, Trey Ginn Smith? If Trey, I could get Traquan both, Ginn Smith. If I could get both for one player, I I would. Can I we would, work that out? I would choose that over either of them individually. There Traquan be, Ginn Smith. There should be a position in leagues that you get to play like it's like a best ball position. You play four guys in one flex mm. spot, and you just get the best score. And then you could start four Saints wideouts and make it easy. Yeah, I, I'm not feeling the shot on either of those guys with the addition of Cook, with the fact that Keith Kirkwood has been, you know, maybe he's more involved. He's been getting buzz in camp. Ginn being healthy. I just think they're all going to have their slight moments that you're not going to be able to tell. And just the, the volume, the overall volume of Drew Brees just absolutely plummeting out the past few years where he went from 471 completions down to 386 down to 364 it's it's clear where the trends are heading for this team he'll still like breeze will still throw touchdowns but i want volume all right the panthers at seven and nine it's time to talk about carolina mm. did either of you guys get to watch all or nothing yet i have not no i heard there's i heard is great I heard uh, there were some very inter some special moments there with uh, Devin Funchess in, the, in, in All or Nothing. No joke. Yeah. Okay. Some some touching moments. I I haven't uh, watched it all yet. Yeah, so I'll, I'll have to take. I haven't a got look. to that part. I am really excited about the Panthers this year. Like I I think that this is one of those bounce back teams who you know a couple of years ago they were in the Super Bowl. They've really kind of imploded since that moment um, when they got shellacked and. Now, I think this is the best version of the offense that Cam has had maybe ever um, because you've got an up-and-coming DJ Moore, Curtis Samuel, Greg Olson is back, Christian McCaffrey is being utilized the right way. I, I'm, I'm absolutely loving the value on a lot of these players in drafts and no one more so than Cam Newton. Cam Newton, I think people forget how good he was last season because yes, of the end. Because the end was so bad. He he, you know, hurt his shoulder. Oh, just needed to hear it. Oh, I I mean, push it again, my man. I, I hear that all day. <laughs> He's in your my guy consideration. I he, hear I hear he a rumor is, from before in, the show. He is in consideration. I think his ADP is outlandish. He's a guy that pretty much always finishes as a top six quarterback when he plays. Ninth Look, round. If he goes and he gets injured, sure, I'll pivot. I'll behind Russell else. Wilson. That's that's all you got to tell me. He's being drafted behind Russell Wilson. Yes, please. I will take Cameron Newton. Yeah, I mean, Cam Newton was, before he went down, was on fire, was a, a top three quarterback last season, has better weapons this year, still is going to run the ball. There's just there's a couple no home games to start the year. The Rams, the Rams are going to put up some points. Cam's going to have to battle in that one. Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay is going to put up some points. I mean, you're always hoping, right? Like when you take your later round shot, you want. I mean, obviously, everyone wants to be like, oh, I've got the number one quarterback <laughs> in fantasy football right. this year. Not many guys in that range have that kind of like they can't compete with the Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, Deshaun Watson tier, but. Cam has, and he's beaten them before. Are you comfortable with drafting DJ Moore as a wide receiver too? Jason, you have him in that range at 17. 
uh, Mike and I more in the I late, late 20s and 30s. Um, DJ Moore, Curtis Samuel, opportunities are there uh, on the outside. Cam Newton, high completion percentage last year. He's transforming a little bit as a passer. Um, what do you guys think about the wide receiver position? I guess you could you could throw Greg Olson in there as a pass catcher and talk about him too, but uh, what are you expecting from this offense? I, the, the problem with DJ Moore is – it just comes down to draft cost. I think he has a, a good a chance as as any of these. A good a chance. A good a chance. A good a chance Italiano. of any of these guys to have have a breakout season. Certainly as a draft capital, and we've we've seen him flash. But right now, going at the back of the fifth round, he's going he's going ahead of Boyd, who actually did break out last year. He's going ahead of Alshon Jeffrey. He's going ahead of Robbie Anderson. I mean, it's the guys who have we've seen a little bit more from. So it's just – it's too much projection for me what about to more, buy the price. What about Moore or Pettis, two guys that don't have a lot of tape? DJ Moore or Dante right. Pettis, where do you sit there? I would go with Dante Pettis. A uh, couple yeah, other examples going behind of that. DJ Moore? Calvin Ridley, Mike Williams? Yeah, I, th I would take Mike Williams over DJ Moore. Calvin Ridley is probably around the same tier for me. See, and, and I, I, I view – the first two differently than the second. I want the one, the the potential to be the ones for their team. I see that in Pettis. I see that in DJ Moore. Uh, I don't see that in Mike Williams, obviously with Keenan Allen there uh, or uh, Calvin Ridley with Julio Jones. So um, DJ Moore's price, it, it is a little bit scary, but you did see him really take over in the second half of the season from weeks 10 on. He was, he was already playing very well um, and he was a rookie. So, all the buzz right now is Curtis Samuel. I mean, he's. I mean, if if you're on Twitter, and you follow beat reporters for Carolina, you, then your Twitter is covered with Curtis Samuel. And Curtis, but Curtis Samuel continues to go very, very late. Tenth round guy. You pay. You pay such a lower price for Curtis Samuel. Um, dominating at every level. Re reception perception showed that he dominated at every level, every route. Uh, Curtis Samuel is the steal on that offense. Give me him in the tenth over DJ Moore in the fifth every day of the week. I just feel like like. What is the actual ceiling for DJ Moore? And are you just – you're literally buying him at that ceiling in the fifth round. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if the, the his ceiling isn't a f late fifth guy. I mean, he was drafted to be an upper echelon receiver. So the ceiling for – like he could be a 10-touchdown guy on the right season. I don't know if that's what Curtis Samuel could do. I mean, so wide receiver – but but I'm saying DJ, I'm just talking specifically to Moore, wide receiver on wide receiver 25 on fantasy football calculators. Like that's what you're paying, yeah, for. Yeah, I think and his ceiling is probably 15. Yeah, that's what I. You see really too. think I, he can get I, there? I do absolutely okay. think his ceiling is 15. If you know, look, Curtis Samuel's getting all the buzz, but I want to know who's going to get all the targets. And if DJ Moore is the number one target option, which I believe he will be. Then yeah, if the offense is clicking, he could very well be a top fifteen guy. Are you interested in drafting the bag of bones that is Greg Olson? Yes. Mm, no. No. I. I mean, look, like, he's <laughs> is your volume. He went, is, here's Jason's the problem. Volume went down when discussing. Here is the problem with Greg Olson. Uh, I could be interested in drafting him because he made he's an incredible value. But this year, more than really any other year that I can remember. The old guys, they're almost all values right now. I mean, Delaney, Walker, Delaney Walker, Jordan Reed. Exactly. Like the superstars of yesteryear them are bones, all. Bones them, bones them. <laughs> well, they're Delaney, all going late, and I would take a shot on one of those guys before I take the shot on Greg Olson. So you're saying you'd rather have Delaney Walker in the 11th yes. than Greg Olson in the 13th? Yes. Oh, yes. In the the 11th to 13th, I don't care of the, the I don't value know. I don't know, man. Two. You got Anthony Miller, Devin Singletary, guys like that in the 11th. I would rather take them. And Ooh. Greg, uh, Greg Olson, uh, with my last pick of the thirteenth or second to last, whatever that is. Interesting. I think I agree with. You. I had you with the Anthony Miller. Where's, pick. Where is Jordan you Reed did. going? Oh, um, okay, because Jordan Reed's the one I'm interested in. Boca Jordan. Raton. <laughs> I, <laughs> retirement is, community. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I I get it. I get that Jordan Reed. It's it's kind of a, just a fantasy football joke at this point. No, it, but it, any of the only player receiving real buzz out of Washington is Jordan Reed. So it's funny. The the 13th round is basically the old busted uh, <laughs> The Isle of Graham. Misfit tight ends. You have Jordan Reed, yeah. Jimmy Graham, Greg Olson, and then you've got the two young guns in Noah Fant and Mark Andrews. 
So of that group, who are all five of those guys? They who are you picking? No offense, Mark Andrews, Greg Olson, Jimmy Graham, Jordan. Reed. I just went I on a read. I just went on a tirade saying I don't target late round tight ends to end up in the seven to twelve range. Right. So I'd rather take my shot on a Mark Andrews if I don't have it. Guess what? I will sign off of waivers. The three of the four guys that don't get drafted in the thirteen in that list. At least that's what I do. Let's talk Falcons seven and nine. All right, it's time. Oh, also, Christian McCaffrey's great. Just. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, it, we don't need to talk about Look, Christmas Cat. He's my number one running back. People out there going, like, what should I do with him? Yeah. <laughs> what should I do? Draft him, <laughs> keep him. He's going to be one of the top four running backs. Um, Dirk Cutter back on the uh, offensive side here for the Falcons. Dan Quinn, head coach, Matt Ryan and company. It's time to talk about these Falcons. Last year they couldn't run the football. We've we've kind of talked about that a lot this offseason. They were a good passing team, 290 yards a game. Um, it, it's an interesting team. Obviously, Julio Jones is great. You start him up, you get going. I think the doubt, the problem in fantasy owners' mind minds right now is related to how much work does the does the Falcons coaching staff want Devonta Freeman to have right. versus sharing that workload. Tevin Coleman is gone. One of the big subtractions of the off season. Spent two first round picks on offensive line to improve this running game. So if Freeman – I have no doubt that if Freeman stays healthy and gets all the work, he'll be great. I just don't know if he can stay healthy, and I don't know if he's going to get all the work because those, those things are part and parcel, right? Like the team has to at some point step back and look at Devonta Freeman and say, boy, we need to measure measure out these reps. You know, let Edo Smith, a guy that this um, head coach drafted, Quadre Olison, give them a shot to lighten the risk of Devonta Freeman. That's the only concern I think that I, exists for Freeman. Sure, but I don't think they can I don't think they can do that cuz Edo Smith was just bad last year and I mean and Olsen's a rookie. I don't I don't think they have the luxury. They are in a window of win now. I mean yeah. you you're you're coming into the later years of Matt Ryan's career. Julio Jones is also coming into later years of his career. Like this, this is the time. The Falcons have to win now, and Freeman is by far the best running back on that team. I, I'm not going to ignore the injury risk. It's it, or say that it doesn't exist, but I'm going to take my shot that depending on, on on how my first two rounds go, I'm perfectly happy with Devonta Freeman ending up as my running back one if I if I get two high-end wide receivers. As your running back one. Oof, yeah. I, I, I'm fine with him as my running back two. I, I don't want to rely on someone that that's that that is that injury risk. Uh, you know, you've got him and Leonard Fournette back-to-back -back in drafts. I don't want either one of them as my running back one. I'm fine to take that injury risk if it's not my main guy because then the truth is what you said with Ito Smith and Quadriolis and, and, and the win-now Falcons I, I believe is correct – they got down around the goal line, and they could not run the ball in. I mean, Matt Ryan had three rushing touchdowns, which is more than his last five seasons combined because he had zero yeah. in, the, in the previous five seasons. They're going to use Devonta Freeman. I have no fear over his utilization, just over his injury. And bad players get play. I mean, Chuck Kendrick West gets play. Devontae Booker gets play. Edo Smith was not efficient, but the, Dan Quinn was the one that came out and said he's going to get a significant increase in offensive looks in February when Tevin Coleman left. So um, it will be interesting. I love him as a two. I would love Freeman as a two because it's going to be a good offense. It's going to be an offense that can move the football. So their opportunities will be there, and maybe you're right. Maybe a couple shots at Ito and Olison failing to get in the end zone is all it's going to take for Freeman to, to re reclaim his crown. And I, I do love this division because when you play – all the teams in this division, usually they're high scoring. You know, some division games are low scoring right. defensive battles. This division is usually just a let's see who can get to 50 points quicker. I love that. But a weird scheduling quirk, the Falcons don't play in the NFC South until week 10. So you're you're not getting that division. What? You know, and then they play five in a row. Schedulers, what are you doing? So it, Giving us content. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> NFL. Jason, are you still an anti-every-other-year Matt Ryan guy? I am somewhat, yes. You would call me an anti-every-other-year Matt yes. Ryan guy. I have him down in my rankings versus where he finished last year. The reason you're saying am I an every-other-year Matt Ryan guy is because, of course, that's what Matt Ryan has done for his 
career, which I don't think is in any way prescriptive of future. <laughs> he like, doesn't look on the calendar and go, dang it. It's oh, it's this an, year. Yeah, I mean, th these are his fantasy finishes over the last few years. Second, great, last year, 15th, second, 19th, 7th, 15th, 7th. So it's it's been a yo-yo, and that's not prescriptive, but it, it, it does point out that when, you, you know, I've got him down around 15, that's very in the realm of his possible outcome. Sure. 50% of his years, regardless of the back and forth nature, he finishes around there, and it's all based on one thing and one thing alone, touchdowns. Okay, he's yes. always – he's part of a great offense. He's going to have a ton of yards. He's going to have a great completion percentage. He's got great weapons this year, so there's a lot to love here, but it's just touchdowns, and he was very, very high – Eight, eight touchdowns more than his previous four-year average this last year, plus those rushing touchdowns I brought up. I just I, I see that reverting when their defense was completely trash last year. They didn't have the ability to run the ball into the end zone last year. I think some of those touchdowns come away. I don't love Matt Ryan as far as finishing as a top three fantasy option this year like he did last year. Now I'm not sure. I like where he's his I like his drafted. ceiling week to week ceiling is great in six point leagues. From weeks 2 through 10 last year, he averaged the exact same fantasy points as Patrick Mahomes. Had seven QB1 performances during that span. So the ceiling for Matt, for Matt Ryan, if you're taking the shot on him, at least that ceiling is being the best quarterback on any given week, which is not something a lot of people can do. You spend a seventh-round pick on him. I don't know if I really I, – I don't think he'll be on any of my teams just because I like guys that are later. Yeah, the draft price is where I'm I'm off of Matt Ryan. I still think he's going to be one of the better quarterbacks. I think he is one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL. But when the seventh round, when you know, like behind him, you've you got know, Carson Wentz behind him, Kyler Murray behind him. Late, late, you've got Cam Newton. I feel and like Jared I have Goff. this. My, I feel like I just have the Russell Wilson line. Like either you're an elite quarterback, you're you're Mahomes, Watson, Andrew Luck, Rogers. Or I'm going to wait until someone has taken Russell Wilson. And though, okay, now now I need to start getting in on the, the quarterback run. Um, talk about Calvin Ridley. He's slid up in drafts to a place that I'm not e extremely comfortable with him. I think he's a very talented player, but he's on that list of the Mike Williams, Tyler Lockett group where, look, very efficient touchdown scorer last season. Overperformed. Um, from an efficiency standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, but obviously can give you a big play. Never going to be the number one guy there. Uh, how comfortable are you with his – what is he in, the fifth round? Where's uh, Where's Calvin Ridley's current ADP? Yeah, Let me grab fifth it for round, you. Yeah, fifth 506 round, yeah, 506 on calculator. Yeah, I just – I find myself – there's not – There's no way that I'm going to take him there. There's no way because, look, last year as a rookie he had 92 targets. That's a lot. So maybe that volume can squeak up a little bit, but it's hard to do that when you threw the ball as much as they did last year and you got Julio Jones there. So barring a Julio Jones – injury which is realistic but barring that I don't think he can squeeze up to become a 125 target guy so now you look at last year he was a wide receiver too but that was on the back of double digit touchdowns I just talked about the fact that Matt Ryan was well over his usual average when it comes to touchdowns and what I expect and Calvin Ridley's do. first year is that a coincidence I do want to bring up last year was from what I can see the highest um touchdown numbers at the quarterback position and passing touchdown numbers that the NFL's had in a while. So like yes, the so numbers were way about, up. When you have a guy with a long career arc, it's hard for me to to look at historical average well, alone. No, not I, not that you are. I'm, I'm not, only looking at his previous 4 years because I think that's fair. It, it, yeah, if you look at Matt Ryan's career, his his obviously the the first half of his career he wasn't a big touchdown thrower. I'm basically talking about since he's broken out as sure. more of an elite fantasy option where he averages 28 passing touchdowns a season okay all right fair enough um any anybody else you want to touch I, austin hooper um yeah i mean he, he was a tight end he was the tight end six guys <laughs> there are some people really excited about him i i cannot get myself yeah, excited about either. austin hooper and and some of the beat reporters they say he's really shining but i don't know man he's he's clearly not at best he is the third target on the team for tight end, there's just higher upside picks. I would just – I mean, I guess – Wait, at best uh, you said he's what? The third target on the so team? Yeah, at, at best he's fourth. No, I'm – Maximum. Okay, so who are you – you're putting Sanu or – Yeah, I would put – Obviously uh, Ridley, Julio are ahead of him. Yeah, and Freeman. Probably if he stays Freeman, healthy. Freeman, not probably, for sure. I mean, it, look, the 
he's been it's just it was his third year in the NFL, so he still has room to grow. But three touchdowns, three touchdowns, four touchdowns last year when he was the tight end what tight end six. That was the lowest point total for a tight end six in a very, very long time. Tight ends have been so incredibly disappointing the past couple of seasons. It correlates highly with the transition to passing to running backs far more frequently. But last year, Austin Hooper, 22% of his yards were in two games. Like He had that, that couple little stretch where it was awesome. You're like, yeah, I streamed Austin Hooper back-to-back, back and it paid off, and then you were very, very disappointed for every other game. All right, we need to talk about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Bruce Arians comes in. Bruce Arians, by all intents and purposes, is the Yogi Berra of the NFL at this point. His quotes are ridiculous. I had one. Did you guys see this quote about uh, the team pooping their pants? I mean, oh, I did. Oh, yeah, this let's go. Sounds I mean, electric. It's, it's right up our alley here. Oh, I'm preparing my ears. Yeah, I will I'll have to find it, but it was essentially <laughs> <laughs> let down. Oh, we man. need the horn on that one. Oh, I boo. figured you heard it. No. Mm. I wanted to hear it. Well, you give teased me, it. Give me great. two seconds. I mean, Shut down the show so I can Google Bruce Arians pooping. I believe he said that they crap their pants and pads. Once they put the pads on, they crap their pants. I love That's, Bruce Arians so much. Yes. Some bucks crap their pants today in pads. <laughs> it's a little raggedy. The noise level went up and some guys messed their pants, but we'll grade the film. I'm just saying the quotes are coming from Bruce Arians. We're going to enjoy them. They already yes. got some pooped in their big boy pants in practice. And they, the, the offense will also enjoy Bruce Arians. His yeah, it, they were already the number one passing yards per game uh, offense last season. Bruce Arians wants to throw the ball down the field. Jameis Winston doesn't always want to throw to his own teammates or near them. Don't tell him what to do. Well, I, I'm not. That's the problem. I think you should tell him what to do because lately people have not been telling him, and he's um, – well. To be fair, that I mean, Jameis, once he came back from his what, – what was that, like the, the third or fourth benching? benching. Yeah. I mean, the third or fourth benching. That's a good sentence. <laughs> good start. He uh, he actually was on his best – the best stretch of his – On his, his best, best behavior. behavior. Yes, no. that's what <laughs> I felt like. like. Oh, you're going to be a little bit more conservative here, not throw the interceptions. But you're right. His touchdown to interception ratio was – That was the best of his career. Very, it was actually – Always is. NFL good for the second right. half of the year. You you do have to keep in mind how young he still is. I know – you know, he's – I think he has room to get better, but he's not great. Like, we – you know, we, we, took we had him, him as a breakout. Yeah, we took him and, out. And we took him out of the breakout category because it's – it's hard to, at this point, just say Jameis Winston's going to get everything together because of Bruce Arians. One of the things I've tried to caution myself on, because I am a big believer in Bruce Arians being great for fantasy. Pace of play when he was with the Cardinals, he was always near the top. So you get this offensive guy coming to a team with great weapons, and you just want to put everyone's arrow up. Here's the problem. They were already a great offense last year. You don't realize that, but in all passing metrics across the board, they're pretty much top three as a team. It, because you had the split between Fitzpatrick and Jameis Winston, you don't look at how, you know, they, neither one of them finished great for fantasy because they split with each other. But now Jameis has it. Maybe he will be a top end option. I'm not saying that couldn't happen. I still think he could break out. It's just hard for me to see it happening where. Where I find the real value, the like not just the news and the anecdote, is the vacated targets. Thirty-eight percent of targets gone. You have Adam Humphreys and Deshaun Jackson that have left a giant void that will be filled by some amalgamation of players. And I think Chris Godwin is the guy that steps into that role now that he's moving into the slot role that Bruce Arians always gets the most out of. There's you know, been plenty of hype videos on in camp already. He's him just, scoring touchdowns. He, he's 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 scoring in camp. He is. Are you serious? Oh, I'm impressed. Uh, look, Evans. Evans was targeted more in the red zone than anybody in football last year. Pretty much, he had eight touchdowns. Look, the targets in in Tampa. They don't. They come with the built-in Jameis Winston uncertainty with all of them this whole offense every every narrative is perfect if Jameis Winston's a good quarterback right and every narrative goes out the window if he's not OJ Howard should be dominant this season talk about 38 percent vacated targets Howard wasn't on the field for all of last year he's a force he should dominate this season if the offense can do he's what they've a done true breakout candidate Absolutely. but you're right it it still requires I mean, James Winston Godwin, to be a good quarterback Chris Godwin had a game at the end of the season 
where he caught one of 10 targets from Jameis Winston. Do we think that Chris Godwin sucks? Absolutely no. not. Okay, so then that is a possible outcome week to week that doesn't exist with a player like Drew Brees at quarterback. So maybe the team will air it out and you're going to blow things up, but you're also, you've got the other end of the spectrum with Jameis Winston, unfortunately, which is in unpredictability, and it's why he's not in our breakout guarantee section of the UDK, but the opportunity is there for Godwin to step up and change his uh, his fantasy baseline as a uh, a fantasy starter. Yes. O.J. Howard, breakout candidate. Howard's a guy that could be a top three tight end. That is not outside the realm of his outcomes. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, last year, Chris Godwin was the wide receiver 25 in fantasy scoring and half-point systems. Right now, he's being drafted as the wide receiver 20. I think he finishes – I 100% think he finishes better than he did last year. He only had seven touchdowns last year. It's not like it was on the back of like Calvin Ridley with 10. Right. So I think he's got a repeatable number there, and I think his target volume is going to go massively up. I think the role is good for him, the vacated targets, but he is being drafted there. He's being drafted as the wide receiver 20, which is a better finish than he had last year. So it's just a matter of how high do you think he can go. You I know, see his ceiling as like wide receiver 15. One of the um, – this was a very interesting um, – you know, in baseball, sabermetrics is all the rage, right? They pay attention to a metric called wins above replacement. And uh, we had we had somebody send us in the – they applied the wins above replacement metric to quarterbacks last season. This was uh, – I'm a shout-out to Jeffrey Henderson who did this. This is a huge metric in baseball, and it basically evaluates how many wins a baseball player contributes to their team. And it's like one of the more dominating metrics – when you apply it to quarterback position last year, Patrick Mahomes was number one by a wide margin in wins above replacement. Makes sense. The number two player on the list, mind you, number three, Big Ben. Number four, Matt Ryan. Number five, Andrew Luck. Number can, six, Cam Newton. Can I take a guess? You can take a guess. Ryan Fitzpatrick. Ryan Fitzpatrick had the second best wins above replacement number. Yeah, that makes so sense. So it's just – He's a good quarterback. And he's going to start in Miami. He's going to start – well, he, he's not going to finish. He's no a start. starter. He's a starter. He's not a finisher. So um, I think that's going to wrap up today's. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no. Who do you want to talk about? The Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap in the 10th round. My man, Peyton Barber. Okay. Okay. Sorry. The running game. Yes. Getting My bad. it done. My bad. Look, it's gross. You don't want him on your team, but he's going to be the starter. And the, the, the latest buzz, we're sifting through the buzz, but it's Peyton Barber actually excited that he's going to get targets. Because of Bruce Arians' system, it's it's not an automatic that Bruce Arians is going to throw to the running back a ton. Well, he doesn't throw it all because he's the coach. What about Andre Ellington? Andre <laughs> Ellington is, is also in, involved, but Barber's, Barber's uh, target volume. I hear he's volume. looking as good as his rookie season, Andre <laughs> Ellington. That's what the word like, was. Like last year, Peyton Barber had 234 carries. Like That is a lot of carries, and in that time, he only had 29 targets. If you so. remember Bruce Arians with Andre Ellington, though, yes. Andre Ellington owned third down. There was a season in Arizona where Andre Ellington started the season as the number one running back on that team. Mm -hmm. I, I would imagine, based on, you know, I know it's a lot of buzz around Ellington, but Peyton Barber, by all metrics, you talk about Edo Smith not being good, Peyton Barber was not good on a carry-by-carry -carry basis. Sure. And Ellington has a proven pass catching record. I'd be really surprised if Peyton Barber, Barber catches a bunch of passes this year. I, I, no, I'm, I'm not saying a bunch, but I still think he will be the primary ball carrier. What about so, a bundle? A, so a maybe a bundle. fair. But <laughs> look, 200 plus carries again for Peyton Barber is not outside the realm of possibility. I, I, in the when, 10th round, that's it's Ronald Jones and Andre Ellington are the other options they have. Yeah. And I just, I see him. I see the reception total going up. If Is he over 30 receptions? Just say it. Tenth round? That's ridiculous. Do you see me troll Jason on Twitter? Tell the, him. Yes. I don't know if I did. With uh, Melvin Gordon signing yes. with the Lions oh. right after the theoretic release. <laughs> yeah, yeah I really, good. really, en good one. really, really enjoyed that. <laughs> it's very fun. <laughs> Do you think the Lions end up bringing somebody else in at all, or they got it figured? out? I think out? they believe in Zach Zinner. I believe in Zach Zinner. It's, they've, they've got three good backs there. I think they're good. Yep. All right. Let's uh, let's close this thing out. Christy. All right, a Michael Thomas signed New Orleans Saints jersey yesterday on pristineauction.com, sold for $58.83. You can get your own sports memorabilia, all authentic autographs, hundreds of daily auctions. You should get your own. Auction.com. You really – You don't yeah. want to steal. No. You want to get your own. Yeah. So, you don't want to be left out in the cold. No. Make, a free, make a free account. 
it's an auction. It doesn't cost you anything to bid unless you win. And then you just pay what you were like, ooh, I, I love that price. Yeah, and when you sign up, if you put in the code BALLERS, you do get $5 towards your first auction purchase. And um, it's a good time. It really is. It's, it's a, a great good time, time to be alive. Um, yeah, NFL season coming quick. We got our live show on Saturday in Los Angeles at the Largo. We got one more live show back here in Phoenix at the end of August. And um, piles of news in between. I know we got another mock draft episode coming up. We're going to talk about some mid-round values on some upcoming shows. And uh, look, it's go time. My, I, I am almost, you know, 20 weeks from five or six championships in these Ooh, leagues. Impressive. Yeah. We'll see right, you next plans. time. See you later. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. All right, Foot Clan, don't forget, Navy Federal is proud to serve over 8 million members, including active duty military, the DOD veterans, and their families. You'll receive a lifetime of membership benefits with Navy Federal, and you can easily access accounts, transfer money, pay bills, and deposit checks with the Navy Federal mobile app. Visit NavyFederal.org slash footballers for more information or call 1-888-842-6328 or download the Navy Federal Credit Union app. Message and data rates may apply.